Chapter 43 The skies had begun to lighten with a thirst of morning riding over the mountains of Ireland. Ian brooded behind me as I pushed open the door and exchanged a look with William. In my absence, he had taken the liberty of clearing off the table. A fresh batch of coffee was brewing, and it looked like he had straightened his notes. I was somewhat irate that there was nothing left for me to do, and so seated myself at the table and recovered my blanket. What time is it? I asked. Nearly dawn, he said. Are you all right? The question surprised me. People don't ask. Then again, I usually do too good of a job hiding things. Genuine concern blanketed his face while he studied mine, and I nodded, not bothering with a fake smile. Yes, I said. You sound like you have something else on your mind, he said. I do. I nodded. One final part to all of this. I smiled. William said nothing but watched and waited, taking his cues from me. I was ready for this day to be over and knew just how to proceed. I jumped back into it for the last time. I love animals. I am an incurable allurophile, but I adore all animals. When Hosea proposed, we had a number of pets in the house. In addition to Tribble, we had a lion-head rabbit, Lily Pippin, who had been with us for four years, and a tank full of Shubunkins and Vrunyunkins. Our fish count totaled more than 40, all of whom I had more than three years. Shortly after receiving Tribble's cancer diagnosis, Pippin suffered from a heart attack. He died in my arms. I felt him go stiff while I was holding him. Two days later, our fish contracted red velvet disease. <laughs> red velvet disease. I call it white death. That is exactly what it is. Parasites breed and form a white cloud in the water. They attach themselves to the fish and burrow into them, making it bleed until the fish look like they're covered with red velvet. Any sensible fish owner would think to do a water change, but that, in fact, kills the fish faster. The parasites cling to the fish during a water change, breed to compensate for the die-off in population, and triple in numbers. The milky residue returns with a vengeance. Every day, for three weeks, I woke to find another fish dead. I was no stranger to grief, but this... What slowly frayed my insanity was the quantity of death. I couldn't get away from it. I know they're just fish. It wasn't about the fish. It was how they were dying. Okay, maybe that was part of it. I spent weeks watching parasites burrow holes through the heads of my fish. I had just buried Pippin. Every morning for three weeks I woke and death greeted me with another dead fish and Tribble was dying of cancer. It was in this condition that one of my friends at work killed herself. If ever there was a day I can say I went mad, it was that day. I couldn't ground myself. I couldn't find myself. I couldn't go home to Tribble who was dying and where death was there waiting for me. I had no doubt he dipped his hands in the fish tank and had claimed another victim. I drove up to my grandparents' house. I went to the only place I knew would give me solace. I went back to the woods. I wandered the path in the gorge for hours. I screamed and cried. I can handle grief, but to lose so much in such a short time? Was it me? I must have asked that question aloud for an hour before I began screaming at death. Didn't I have enough? I've been burying people and my pets my whole life. I'm pretty sure I had paid my dues. Thinking back to that month, every time my half-brother beat me, I reflected on what I had done, why the event occurred, what was it for. After every rape, every death, every trial in my life, I followed it up with one question. What am I being prepared for? I couldn't believe this was it. I couldn't believe I hadn't endured three years of waiting for pissant for nothing. No, that was training for something bigger coming my way. I couldn't believe the rapes with Joe, the rapes with Scott, and the ten years away from Hosea had been for nothing. I was certain I was being prepared for something. That month, with Pippin, my fish, and my friend dying, I was being prepared. I just couldn't see what. It took me four months to recover from that month. I lost my job. It was two months before the wedding, but this time we were financially stable enough that Hosea gave me the okay to dedicate all my time to writing. The process returned me to my cave where I shut myself in with Ian, my book, and me. Hosea and I were hand-fasted in the summer of 2013 on the solstice, complete with a 40-foot bonfire under the roundest full moon of the year. It was epic. Through all of this, I continued to write my first book. Eighteen months later, I finished. But 18 months without men, medication, therapy, or counseling was two years too long. David, Hosea, had made me aware of my issues, but addressing them was something entirely different. I regressed. 
Within that time, Tribble's cancer had taken a turn for the worse. She purred happily at my right side. Oh, God. <laughs> she purred happily at my side right up to her final day when I made the call and drove her in. I stayed with her for hours. I held her and cried. We put her in the box and Hosea helped me bury her. I let her go. No, no, I didn't. I never let her go. I turned her body over to Hosea, but I had begun to let her go. I held myself together. I felt the tears fall. The moment I was inside the house, I broke. I fell to my knees and I screamed long and hard and long. And for the first time in 17 years, Tribble wasn't there. I could cry all day and let the grief eat me. She was no longer there to anchor me or bring me back. So I did what I always do. I shut it down. I buried it. I killed my emotion and I went cold. With Tribble's death, time slipped by. The hand-fasting contract between Jose and I expired. We had discussed getting legally married, but the financial backlash in the state of New York was financial suicide, and so we did nothing. Three months later, April of 2014, my book was finished. In October, I launched into the world of social media. I took to it like a fish to water and found that it complemented and enabled my mental state. I made connections, found my editor, and formed writing groups that developed into a stone comradeship. It filled part of the loneliest I had had my whole life. By November, I had met Pat online, who offered to beta read my manuscript. Coming from someone of her caliber, the offer she made was a substantial one, one that I am eternally grateful for. Within a few short weeks, she asked if I would be willing to return the favor. I happily agreed. Her book was about a rape victim. I thought I could handle it. I thought I was ready. Maybe I wasn't ready. I was certain I was. I explained the situation to Jose, and he asked if I could handle it. I assured him I could. I told Pat yes. The next month, I underwent conversations that explored the psyche of a rape victim. By, develop by delving into my past, I helped Pat with her character. I was cold, systematic, and logical about the process. I was cold. That should have been my first clue. Around the same time, I was tearing apart my own manuscript and subjecting it to edits one last time. The work I was doing forced me to con contact one of my beta readers, Jacob. He and I had grown quite close and were writing via email nearly every day. The conversations were growing more in depth as we picked apart and analyzed my book. I plugged away and he did his best to answer, but the emails were limiting us and the topic was delving into a complex area. Can I just call you? Jacob asked, and there was the panic. No, 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 I, I, I can't, I wrote. Well, how about I text you? I don't have email at the house and this is getting involved. I can't just, I can just call you and we can get through this a lot faster. No, never mind, thanks. Before he could ask, I was gone. But a few days later, I was right back to needing the answers I had asked for. I tried again, and after several rounds of questions, the answers grew longer. Can't I just call you? Jacob asked. No, text you. Can I text you? I can't, I wrote. Why not? I just can't. Online, I was a social butterfly. Online, I was exactly what I wanted to be. Online, I could let my guard down without fear of losing control. And if I had an issue or a bad day, I could hide it so easily from everyone. Online, I was safe. By the end of the second day, we were back to the same exchange. Look, if only for five minutes, Jacob said. Not long. I can't. Why? I had to tell him. I'm a shut-in, I wrote. What? Yes, very. I don't, I don't speak to people. I'm a recluse. Okay, well, how about we text? Can we text? I promise I won't call. I'll just text. I thought about it. Promise no calling? I said, no calling. I thought about it some more. Already I felt the panic followed by the arousal. But if we were only texting, okay, I wrote. The text lasted a day. This is really getting intense, he wrote. You're really getting involved here. Can I call? Panic. I felt myself grow wet. My body responded to the trigger. No! No calling! It's okay. I understand. No people, he wrote. But how about we try this out? I'll call and say one word. You don't even have to say anything. You just answer. I'll say, so. Then hang up. You don't even have to say anything. My body was shaking, and the urge to fuck something was unbearable. I, 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 I can't. Well, what if we just listen to each other breathe? Could you do that? He went back down. He had to understand. I'm terrified of men, I wrote. Silence. It felt like forever. What? 
Already my state of arousal was high. The panic waged while my body prepared for sex. I knew how bad I had gotten in the last two years. I knew exactly the mindset I was in. If I heard him now, I would throw myself at him. I would absolutely pursue him and beg him to fuck me. But I liked him. I loved our friendship. And I didn't want to change that. I loved writing with him and working with him. Please let me call you, he wrote. I stared at the text. Why do you care? Why can't you just go? Just go. I grabbed one of my katanas from the display and clutched it for dear life while waiting for the panic to ease, waiting for my arousal to subside. All I wanted to do all over again was fuck and run, but the urge this time was so much worse than ever before. I couldn't even leave the house. I can't, I wrote. Why can't you? Because I still... Because I will fuck you, I wrote. I will want to fuck you to be safe, but it isn't me. I will tell you things to make you fuck me. I will beg you, but I don't want it. And I will do this to make you love me so you won't hurt me. But I don't want you to love me because you can't have me. And I would hurt you when I leave you. If you call, I will throw myself at you. Let me call you, he wrote. It took me 20 minutes to calm down enough to talk to him. My body shook and I spent the conversation gripping my katana and biting my tongue. I wanted to fucking run. He seemed to know exactly what to say. He asked me about my characters in my book. I answered, quietly battling back a plethora of propositions. He asked about my writing and mundane things, things he already knew the questions to, anything to keep me calm. I thought knowing what, what it was inside of me, knowing exactly what I would expect, it would make it better for, it would make it far more manageable. It didn't. I knew what I wanted, knew why I wanted, and I thought that alone would be enough to control it. It didn't. I made it through three questions before I asked the one question at the forefront of my mind. What do you want with me? I want to be your friend, he answered. But why? I asked. What do you get out of this? What do I get out of it? Our friendship. But I couldn't understand. Don't you want to have sex with me? No. This really confused me. I don't understand, I said. Why would you waste your time with me if you don't want sex? Because we're friends. I didn't understand. No male had ever wanted to just be my friend. No male was ever just my friend. But what is your goal? I asked. What is your purpose? If not to sleep with me, then what? I want to show you that you can have a male friend without having sex with them. I rolled the answer around in my head. I had no idea what to make of it. I could see no error in his logic, no holes in his argument, not ones I could logically pick apart, but something was still inherently wrong with his logic. I did find his reasoning highly suspicious. I accepted it for now. I spoke to Jacob for eight hours that day. I hung up the phone and hugged my legs to my chest. With him off the phone, I felt myself relax again as I eased back into my solitude. Aside from my family, it had been nearly two years since I had spoken to a male, and that's when I realized the sessions I had had five years ago with David hadn't changed a thing. I was still afraid of men. I was still locked up in a room. I still wanted to fuck them if they came near me. I still had a raging amount of fear inside of me. I was still in the Asian jungles. An angel was screaming.